Hi, I'm David Marchant, the founder of Offshore Alert, which investigates participants in high value cross-border finance with an emphasis on high confidentiality jurisdictions. Our specialty is exposing investment fraud while it's in progress. Enjoy our content. Um, I'm very uh, happy that I can present uh, some of the work we're doing at the Visual Investigations Unit. Um, my name is Christian Trieber. I work there as a journalist. And um, um, yeah, in the coming, let's say like 40, 45 minutes, I want to show some of the work we're doing. Um, I'm not sure how it works with like uh, people that can ask questions. I mean, I'm happy uh, if there's some kind of chat or uh, when people have questions, um, feel free to interrupt me. Um, feel free to uh, ask questions at the end. I'll leave some time for the end, um, but um, please let me know. Um, but um, yeah, if you hear some sound in the background, it's because I'm in New York and uh, New Yorkers are uh, always loud in traffic. Um, that having said, yeah, let me let me show you uh, just uh, to get right into it, um, what Visual Investigations is. So um, the New York Times Visual Investigations unit is a very new unit at the New York Times. We started um, a couple of years ago, around three years ago, started by an Irishman, uh, Maliki Brown. And it's a new form of accountability and um, investigative journalism um, combining traditional reporting, as, as the newspaper has always done, um, with newer forms um, and methods to investigate uh, misconduct around the world. So think of satellite imagery, 3D modeling, um, um, radar imagery, um, uh, uh, sound analysis, uh, you name it. And we basically focus on um, international issues, national issues, local issues, uh, anything really where we think we can uh, make a strong contribution to the work that is um, that is already out there. So um, um, what you see here in the top left is the reconstruction of a chemical attack in Syria in 2018. Uh, on the top right, we can see the, Las uh, the, the shooting in Las Vegas. Um, and uh, bottom left, we can see um, uh, Stephen Clark, a, a young black man that was killed by police. And uh, we reconstructed that as well, or a team did. And uh, in the bottom right, we can see um, the killing of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, a um, Saudi dissident and journalist that was um, killed by a Saudi um by a saudi led task force or Sa saudi task force in the saudi um, consulate in istanbul now um we use a lot of different ways to 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 investigate and as well present our findings so uh one way is collecting and analyzing footage right so what we see here is um um a lot of different video clips from uh, protests in gaza palestine um, near the border with Israel. And um, what's happening here is that a Palestinian medic, Ruzan al Najjar, was uh, killed by an Israeli sniper. And um, our team uh, set out to um, reconstruct um, what happened before, during, and after uh, the shooting, um, reconstructing the event in, in, in seconds, really. And because there's so much footage nowadays, uh, one big thing we always do when a big incident happens is collecting all that footage and analyzing it to get a better understanding what may have happened. Um, so that's one thing. Um, then we also use um, uh, a lot of satellite imagery mostly to verify visuals. Verification obviously in the uh, digital areas is a very important uh, point. So one process that I will talk about later as well is, is what we call geolocation which is basically finding a, um, a source image, which we here have on the left of a bombing in Syria. And we use satellite imagery to match up um, uh, details, such as um, here we can see a hole in the roof, but the trees, the walls, and so on. Now, another another one that's, that's maybe specifically interested for this crowd is a ship and plane trackers, right? So as you know, most of the ships and civilian ships and planes, aircraft will have transponders and uh, with a receiver, you can um, uh, follow these ships and with websites like Marine Traffic or Flight Radar 24, um, you have a database of um, publicly trackable ships and aircraft that we often use. And this case you're seeing right here is the tracking of a 
uh, of luxury goods, specifically luxury cars, uh, from Western Europe to eventually North Korea, because Kim Jong-un likes to drive very fancy cars, but he can't really acquire them directly because um, there are sanctions on North Korea, of course. So this investigation um, uh, tracks uh, uh, those luxury goods to North Korea. Um, Weapons identification is a very important part. Here we can see an Iranian anti-material rifle, and uh, by tracking it, it may say something about the support they're giving to groups, or uh, when we see this uh, specific rifle in a photo, um, a sniper rifle, um, uh, we may get a sense of, okay, where which group could we be looking at. Um, 3D kind of reconstructions are very important. So um, that uh, killing of the Palestinian medic uh, by an Israeli sniper that I talked about before, um, we teamed up with the um, research agency uh, 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 Forensic Architecture, which models, um, uh, does 3D modeling. And uh, this is the moment and in, in, in orange, the, the, the few of the uh, sniper uh, uh, that had that it had on the uh, medic in orange, um, volunteer medic, and in white are other medics around, and it was a clear view on the medic. And um, um, I mean, this is this is a long form investigation, still one of the most intense I've ever seen. Um, definitely recommend watching it. Um, but you can see, um, based on all the footage that we had, um, the team was able to um, map out the whole scene. Um, second by second, basically, split second by split second, just to get a real sense of what was going on. Um, showing that the medics nor anyone else in that crowd formed any kind of danger for the uh, Israeli snipers. But they still took the shot, um, which is um, highly problematic and highly questionable why they did. Um, you can see our work at nytimes.com slash visual investigations. That's our landing page. Um, um, for those of you that are in journalism, um, one of the investigations we conducted last year on um, the Russian Air Force in Syria uh, got awarded with many, many journalism prizes, uh, including the, the Pulitzer Prize. It was part of a body that, that won the Pulitzer Prize, which is uh, arguably one of the biggest uh, journalism prizes there is. Um, so that's, that's, that's a great investigation uh, we did last year. We focus on many other uh, things, right? Like so, Hong Kong, uh, Venezuela, um, Khashoggi, which I already talked about uh, very briefly, but also local stuff, right? Like a black driver, a marijuana bus, and a body camera that turned off, which is an investigation uh, by my colleague Barbara, which which strongly um, suggests that an NYPD officer planted evidence in um, the car of a black driver here in New York. Um, we have um, investigation into the conduct of the U.S. military as well. Um, they were denying that they were responsible for bombing that killed 11 children. Um, but after investigation, they changed um, their story and admitted that they conducted the bombing, albeit still denying that there were any civilians. Um, the Israeli soldier killed a medic in Gaza. I talked about it briefly. Uh, Kim Jong-un and how he gets his uh, luxury goods. Um, but also Nigeria, um, lots of stuff uh, recently reconstructing uh, police violence in the United States, uh, including the killing of uh, George Floyd, but also Ahmed Aubrey, um, David McAtee, um, and uh, the Kenosha uh, shootings, the, the, the protest there where a, um, a teenager uh, shot and killed multiple people. And we reconstructed that incident as well, um, second by second, basically. So um, a lot of the information we use is openly available information, like satellite imagery, social media footage, and so on. And I think um, I would want to show one case in more detail that really goes to show um, how we conduct these investigations. So that's the case of the um, uh, flight PS752, which was an Ukrainian airliner that was shut down um, by Iran earlier this year, uh, at the beginning of this year, actually, uh, January 8th. Um, it's been a very long year, 2020, um, for those that you remember. Um, and this was one of the first incidents, um, major news events that happened. And we were able to break down and, and break news what happened. Um, and it's really nothing else. This all was done. None of us had access to Iran immediately. So this was all done from behind our laptop and we did internet connection and using uh, predominantly openly available sources. So basically, anyone with an internet connection could have conducted this investigation. Um, I come from a group, for those interested, I come from a group called Bellingcat, which is uh, the, one of the pioneers 
in this field of what we call open source investigation. Um, and um, um, and Bell and Cat did a simultaneous investigation as well, proving the same thing. Um, let me quickly grab my uh, my charger because I just want to make sure that it doesn't switch off. Obviously, um, that would be a pity. Um, so flight PS752. So um, just quickly. My charger here. There we go. It's been a busy news day, so. Um, it basically started like this. It's 10.27 p.m. in uh, New York, where uh, most of the team is based. And one of my colleagues, Dave Horn, uh, on Slack, which is the messaging platform that we use at the New York Times, is saying like, whoa. And he's saying, whoa, because uh, there is a report that a Ukrainian plane, a Ukrainian airlines plane had crashed near Imam Airport, which is um, which is the um, uh, 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 main airport near Tehran, the Iranian capital. Now, he's saying, whoa, um, because we were tracking at that time um, Iran's response to um, the killing of General Qasem Soleimani, uh, a top Iranian uh, general that was killed by the United States. And everyone was expecting Iran would retaliate, and they did. And they did so on January 7th. And we were monitoring what they were, um, how they were retaliating. So several um, ballistic missiles were fired from Iranian territory into Iraqi ter territory on uh, military targets from the um, coalition there, the US-led coalition. And um, we were in the process of trying to figure out what did they bomb, did people die, um, is there further escalation? Because obviously we are a very big US newspaper, right? And obviously we're like, okay, the tensions between Iran and US are so high, we need to track this. So we're all, um, I was still in the office at the time, uh, many others were as well. And um, I'm just I'm just a reporter, right? But on Slack it's interesting to see how it goes, right? Okay, hey, um, someone else, some other colleague, uh, Whitney, which one of my managers, she's like, oh, uh, Reuters is actually confirming now, right? Because Reuters is reporting that uh, 180 people aboard uh, the plane crashed. And first reports were suggesting that everyone on, died, uh, on board died. And it's like, what the hell is going on? So you can see um, Maliki, who is one of our managers, um, is like asking, hey, uh, Haley, Evan, Christian, which is me, um, can you look into it? Can one of you look into it? But this is what we're doing, right? This is what we what we what 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 we are passionate about. There's something happening in the world, and we want to figure out what's going on because it seems 180 people um, that are just on a civilian airliner were just they just crashed. Is this crash malicious? Is what did, did something happen? Especially during these heightened tensions, right? So we're all like you, sir, another colleague. Everyone is like, okay, let's 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 go for it, right? Let's 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 go 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 find out what we can. And um, around like after midnight, our managers like go home. Uh, thanks for tonight. But obviously, like that's not really what happens because we're right in this process of figuring out what's going on. And as you most of you will know, like if you have digital information, it's very easy to remove this information. So um, as the night fell, we knew it would be morning in Iran, and we would need to be moving fast and collecting information. So I want to show you what we were doing and basically the skeleton of our investigation is uh, publicly available flight tracking data so flight radar 24 is one of several websites that tracks and uh, 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 publicly uh, or mostly civilian um, uh, aircraft that are flying around well it also tracked the um, doomed ps752 flight and um, we had the data here, and the great thing is that you can um, just see how it's taking off here in, in yellow, right? That's the aircraft icon. It's taking off from Iman Khomeini International Airport in Iran. Um, white indicates it's still on the ground. Now it's green. It's 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 ascending, um, uh, it's gaining height, and then there we have the last transponder signal before it disappears from the radar. Now, the great thing is that we can buy, uh, buy we can <laughs> download it for free, actually, um, as a CSV file, but we can also download it as a KML, KML file, which is a file for Google Earth. Now, um, that's great because if I download that file and 
open it in Google Earth, Google Earth Pro, which is also software that is available for free. Um, uh, revolutionary, I would say, in the amount of information that, that we have access to, right? And I can just watch that same line, that flight path in Google Earth, but it's not just a 2D um, view right now as we had on the website, but I can, as you can see, you can hover around. I have satellite imagery under it, and I can see the height it has gained, the altitude it has gained uh, while after taking off. And um, I get a better sense where that last transponder signal of the aircraft was before it was um, um, shoot uh, before it was uh, uh, disappeared from um, the radar. So um, this is really like the skeleton, the factual skeleton that we have to start our investigation with. Now, using keywords in Farsi, um, we were able to find some videos of people that were driving around and they were filming as it sees, as it seemed, um, the airplane going down. So um, we are collecting this material, but we couldn't immediately verify it because um, I talked about this process of geolocation before, right? And usually when we do geolocation, um, we're looking for the visual clues that are in the footage to link it to the satellite image, right? To see like, hey, can we find out this road or this tower or this water tower? But in this case, if we look here at the footage that was coming out, um, we um, there's very little to go on to, right? We can see someone driving in a car. We can see another person driving a car and we can see a person walking around. Now, first watching this footage, we assumed that fireball that we see in the sky going down um, must be the plane, right? And people were sharing this footage as saying that a plane had crashed. Now, we could publish this material and say, oh, this is what it's um, what it appears to show. But our unit, visual investigations unit, is not to say what it appears. We only want to know what are the facts and can we can we find out what happened. So we didn't publish this, but we're just matching up, syncing, synchronizing the video. Um, and we're using this moment where you can see this big light flash as a way to sync up those three videos, to, just to make sure whether what they appear to show the same incident. And if we then scroll back, we can see the fireball and at the speed and at the altitude it's losing, um, that it indeed appears to show the same incident. But not to say that this is in Iran, right? We hear Farsi being spoken on the background, but people could fake that. But it does appear to show this may be indeed from the moment because these videos had not been posted online before a, a reverse image search showed. So we had our first clue. An interesting thing is like, Iranian authorities were saying that um, the plane had crashed due to a technical malfunction. Now, if we look at this footage, we can see that fireball going down, slowly but surely going down. So, and it seems to be on fire. If that's indeed the plane, it would maybe indicate that they're indeed, um, that we're indeed talking about um, a, um, a technical malfunction, right? Seems the, the plane is on fire and um and um that is um uh, that may be due to a fire on board technical function you name it but it doesn't seem as we've seen with previous plane clashes like mh17 a case that the group that i came from bellingcat thoroughly investigated um a missile is being fired towards the aircraft it explodes near the aircraft and then um then it's over um, that didn't really seem to be the case here because it's slowly going down, right? So what was going on? Well, we knew it would be getting morning in Iran um, relatively soon. So we knew more imagery would be coming out. So before we would take uh, uh, some sleep to, to continue the investigation, um, started mapping out potential locations of interest around that last transponder signal. So one thing was like, okay, it may be a technical function, but hey, maybe, it was shut down. We don't know. But what we started doing is mapping out uh, military sites around um, the crash site. So um, what we see here is the interface of uh, around Tehran, the Iranian capital, of um, uh, uh, Wikimapia. Now, Wikimapia is a website that um, uh, uh, is basically the Wikipedia for mapping uh, and satellite services. So what it does, it's it's superimposing a, uh, or it's basically overlaying 
user annotated tags of geographical location. So you can see here Imam Khomeini International Airport in, uh, in, in, in uh, at the bottom, right? And um, why is this so interesting? Because um, you may think, why don't you just use Google Maps, right? Or the Russian equivalent, Yandex Maps. Well, the thing is, it's not as populated. The maps are not as populated with information as Wikimapia's. Now, Wikimapia, again, is user-generated information, so it's by no means verified, but it's a good starting point. It's a stepping stone to find out more information. So if I click on categories in the top, I can also click military. And if I click military, you can see all those red dots appearing, which are basically, um, which are basically um, military sites tagged by users. So, Parant, which we, because, which we see there on the map, just um, south um, west of uh, Tehran, was where that last transponder signal was spotted, was received. So those military sites around it are potentially interesting. What I did is I, I sent a quick email to um, to the James C uh, Martin Center for Non-Proliferation at the uh, US West Coast, and they had a guy, Fabian, Fabian Hinz, that was very closely tracking Iran's um, uh, missile and anti-air defense uh, capacity. So I, I, I cross-checked those locations with him just to add them all, remember, to that um, uh, Google Earth file, right? Getting all this information, building up layers of information that may be useful for analysis. I'll go back to that that um, uh, Google Earth file later because again that 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 flight data was a skeleton and we're adding extra layers of information here. Now, quick night of sleep. We're waking up and yes, indeed, images are coming out from the crash site. Um, and what we're always trying to do when we see videos from crash sites like these is looking for visual clues that may indicate where or um, uh, uh, when this video was filmed. Now, we did a quick reverse image search. Uh, this video didn't appear on the internet before, it seems. So we thought, okay, this may be authentic. Again, the New York Times couldn't immediately send someone to the crash site, so we had to do it with digital information. So we're looking at this, we're looking at this, and I'm looking for something that can give me a hint of where it was filmed. And there we go, what I just saw there is something that appeared to be a water tower. And if we look at the water tower and we look at another image from the crash site, we can see that water tower here as well. It's pretty distinct, right? It has those uh, rectangular markings, um, red and white. Um, and uh, we can see a road in front based on how the um, emergency vehicles are parked. Now with that same website, um, Wikimapia, I can click water towers and find all the water towers that are around that last transponder signal. And um, quickly, even on Twitter, people were, uh, I come from Twitter actually, I, if it wasn't for Twitter and posting my findings on Twitter, I don't think I would have ever worked at the New York Times. Um, and on Twitter, someone else, uh, uh, a random account, uh, quickly found, um, uh, suggested a location where this water tower could be. Now, if we um, if we uh, go to that location in Google Earth, um, we can match it up with the ground source imagery and do that process of geolocation, right? Confirm that it's indeed the same location. So we see the water tower right here in the top left corner. And um, when we uh, put that image next to it, we can see the buildings, we can see the road on which the emergency vehicles are being parked, and of course the water tower itself. Now, this image you see in the background is a high resolution image uh, in Google uh, Earth that uh, gives away a lot of detail, right? Now, the easiest thing would obviously be get an image from the crash site, which this would be the, the suspected crash site. Um, but it's not that high resolution satellite imagery is being captured from all locations in the world every single day. So I'll have to work here with lower resolution satellite imagery, which is usually captured every single day. So we'll go to Sentinel, um, which is uh, uh, by the European Space Agency. All their imagery is for free, available online. And what we're gonna do is trying to see whether it spotted um, the crash site, right? So um, this is an image from that area um, uh, before the crash happened. And um, the image you're looking at is a false, a so-called false color image. So these are not the colors how we as human beings see them, um, but it's a combination of uh, uh, the different 
um, sensors that the satellite has and the information it gets. And um, it's really good to spot change in vegetation, which is in this in this image red. Now, if we go to an after image, which is here, I hope you can see it uh, on your screen at home. Um, if not, um, I can share uh, some links afterwards that, 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 that lays it out in detail so you can see the images for yourself. We can see a black marking appearing uh, within that yellow rectangle. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download that image and I'll make it an overlay in, again, Google Earth, right? So here we have that tower. What I'm going to do, I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to overlay that new image but it's lower resolution and you can see in red, I'm going to have it unlined in red, that scarred, seemingly scarred vegetated area um, on the image. So what I'm doing now is I'm removing that low resolution image and I end up with the older high resolution image, but at least with an ID where the crash site seems to be. Like this is a very strong indication that indeed the geolocation is correct. Something happened there and indeed uh, later images from the crash site indeed confirmed that this was the exact same location. Now, this was not all. What we also see here is that um, there was mostly scarred area from the view that we have right now, the perspective that we have right now. But if we would turn around that view, we would see that very little um, buildings, walls were scarred or had burned uh, uh, um, markings, which seemed to indicate very strongly that the plane crashed from um, uh, the close side to us, going towards the further end that we're seeing in the photo and in the satellite image. Now, why we later had a CCTV surveillance camera footage that indeed confirmed this. Why was this so interesting? Well, remember, we're trying to figure out what happened to this plane. Was it shut down? Was it a technical malfunction? We already had those videos slowly going down, the aircraft slowly going down um, as it is burning. But what this also showed is that the aircraft from its last transponder signal which by some people was said, this is the crash site, which it was clearly not, because this site you're seeing here was a few kilometers away from that last transponder signal, that in fact, the plane had crashed. And was going back towards the airport, which obviously led some credibility to the theory that um, we uh, that this airplane wasn't shut down, but was actually may have had a technical function and was going back towards the airport. Very interesting finding, which we um, which these small nuggets we published in in in, in the reporting of other uh, reports that the New York Times are reporting on this. But we're still looking for more evidence, right? Now online there were also a lot of people that are saying, look, look at the wreckage seems that we see bullet holes or like um, missile holes in that aircraft. This looked very similar to the wreckage of MA-17, the aircraft that was shot down uh, by Russian-backed separatists in eastern Ukraine in 2014. However, uh, one Bellingcat contributor, Nick Waters, was very quick to show this is nonsense, because if you look at the higher resolution photo of that same wreckage remain, uh, wreckage part, you can see those are actually just stones laying among the fuse uh, on the fuselage, and they are casting a shadow, and that's why it seems that they're holes on the low resolution image, but in fact they're not. Now we were scouring lots of different social media for more information, and Iran, of course, is an authoritarian country. Information is limited, but we did find. Um, we were alerted to a video that emerged on a Telegram channel. Telegram is a messaging app just like WhatsApp um, that uh, was uh, would become the most important piece of um, our video of, of sorry of our investigation. And it's this video. It's only 15 seconds long. Um, I'm not sure whether you are hearing my, um, whether you're hearing my, uh, excuse me, whether you're hearing my system audio, but if you're not, I will just, um, I will just uh, uh, um, uh, m m m tell you what, what, what you hear. So it's very short. Let's look at it first in normal speed. 
and um, then let's analyze it a little bit further. So let's look at it first. Flash. We hear a dog barking one time. Don't hear it much. It seems like you hear like an aircraft sound. We hear a big boom. See some ducks running. Yeah, you hear a car alarm going off. That's it. Now, this video claimed to show a missile hitting flight PS752. Now, if that would be indeed the case, this would be world news. This would be breaking news because this would be evidence that Iran shut down an airliner while they were claiming it was a technical malfunction. Uh, 180 people died, right? So this is super important. So how can we verify this video? Let's look at the clues. We have some, we have some apartment blocks. Um, we have some kind of construction site on the front. There's some 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 booth here to the left with 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 light on, and here uh, here this, this is a construction site, something like that. And here to the right, we first thought is this like a barbecue, but then as a closer look, uh, it turned out to be a cement mixer, which even led more. Um, even more stronger suggestion that it could be a construction site. Now, um, there's another very important clue here. Um, first of all, we can see that light bulb right here. It's traveling from left to right. Given the speed it is going, that would be assuming that would be the missile. The missile is going towards an object in the sky that we can't see, but it seems to be exploding here, right? And then after that happens, we can see a light bulb traveling further from right to left, continuing in the sky. We assume that's the aircraft that is now on fire. Those are some clues because the level is coming from the sorry the missile is coming from left to right and the aircraft is coming from right to left. So that gives us some sense how should we look for that area in um, satellite imagery to try to geolocate this exact spot. Now another one is this, and I'm going to count with you. Um, this is probably one of the very few occasions that journalists use um, the Pythagoras theorem to verify video material. Um, but first, let's think of the speed of sound, right? So you have an explosion, you see it happening in the air, and the boom happens way later. So look at this. Flash, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and it's only now that you hear the boom. Now, I'll count it a bit fast. We made exact calculations, two to three calculations, right, just on frame rate where you see the flash until you hear the boom. It was about 10 and a half seconds before the speed, 10 and a half seconds, before the sound reached the filmer. Now, with a quick calculation that says something about, hey, what, um, uh, 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 how, what is the distance between the filmer and that explosion? Secondly, if this is indeed showing that Iranian airliner, remember we have that flight data. The flight data also shows the altitude. So if we have the altitude, we have the explosion height and the, um, uh, 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 I mean, we have, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have that data, what it is to the ground level. Combined, you could see um, the filmer is, uh, is on the ground. Um, the point, we know the point to the ground where the aircraft had its last transponder signal. We know that these distances. So with the Pythagoras theorem, we can calculate what the distance is to the filmer and the location under the explosion, which we would want to have for satellite imagery. So I'm going to switch now to my live view of Google Earth. This is my Google Earth interface. And um, I'm going to show you what our skeleton, how far it is was developed. So remember, we have here the aircraft, right? And if I go, you can see um, you can see how it is uh, the skeleton. Uh, sorry, the, the the flight path is here. 
This is all 3D. You can see here all the military sites that I talked about earlier. I have to tag them in green. You know, we got some more information about what they were. Um, we have some more military sites right here and here. And remember, we managed to geolocate relatively quickly the exact location. My manager, Maliki, was really fast in finding that cement mixer right here, the construction site right here, and those apartment blocks that we saw in the video. And everything might matched up. Why was it so relatively easy? Because we knew, okay, hey, the, the aircraft is coming. We are assuming it's coming from right to left. The missile must be coming from left to right. So it must be somewhere in this area because this is the last transponder signal. So we also knew this circle is the speed of sound circle. This is the distance, how far the speed could have traveled. So we knew it must be relatively close to that last responder signal. Now, by that, it was relatively easy to find this. Um, we matched everything up, the locations matched, and then we're just drawing the lines of perspective here. And this circle became the uh, area above which the aircraft must have flown when it was hit by that missile that we saw. Now, we later discovered that it was the second missile and there was actually a first missile being fired. That's why it lost transponder signal here. Continued flight for a bit. Second missile hits the aircraft right here, then starts flying. We don't know exactly wh how, what happened, but it starts flying, probably maybe on autopilot, not completely destroyed. Um, in half a circle and it crashes far away here. This is, remember, this is that low resolution satellite image. We we geolocated some of the parts of the aircraft. Now, um, you can see how that skeleton was built out in, in a way more complicated. We could follow the missile trajectory. Um, we suspect it was fired from this base. And we explained this, or my manager did, to, 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 to the top editors at the New York Times, like, we have evidence we have visual evidence that the new that Iran shut down a civilian airliner, and um, um, that's pretty intense. So we published this piece. It went out with an alert. Everyone that has the New York Times gets an alert, and this was breaking news, right? Like Iran shut down the airliner while they say it was a technical malfunction. Um, within a day, whether it was because of this investigation and more um, public, publicly pressure, uh, public pressure, mounting pressure on um, on a, a Iran, um, we we uh, uh, within a day, Iran admitted that they actually shut it down, as they said was due to a human error. But I think if anything, it goes to show that even though you have an authoritarian state where information sharing is uh, suppressed and oppressed. Um, some information can make it out, and it ends up to us, to journalists and other internet investigators, to verify that material and get it out into the world to to show what happened and hold um, all the power to account. So I think this is a really good example how um, openly available information, um, all from behind a laptop, uh, could become uh, global breaking news. Um, so yeah, that's 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 my uh, insight, uh, brief insight into. Um, into uh, visual investigations. We do many more investigations, so uh, please check it out on nytimes.com um, slash visual hyphen investigations. Uh, I'll put the link up one more time here. Um, so check it out. We do many different investigations. We're always open for suggestions. I think the audience that 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 that, that is at offshore alert um, it's an audience um, that we can learn from a lot. Um, I'd be very happy to 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 discuss story ideas, um, things that we should investigate, things that we should pay attention to, because I think this crowd uh, knows a lot about things that we don't know about, and um, it would be great um, to collaborate um, so uh, and get information and do further investigation. So yeah, please please let me know. I'm I'm gonna exit my screen share. Um, and I'm not sure how this works, but if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to uh, to answer them. Oh, and how do I go to the team's chat? So I can read it, Christian. Uh, how, how accurate is this form of investigation, would you say? 
you know, what's the sort of margin for error? Um, I would say we would only publish things that we're 100 percent sure about. Right. So um, we we will go to such a like the core of our work, I would say, is verification. So everything we do, right, like goes to the core. Can we verify the exact location? Can we verify its authenticity? Can we verify the date? Sometimes we use the shadows to calculate the time of the day a photo was taken, right? So all that information we use to get a better sense of what is going on. So, for example, with the killing of George Floyd, we obtained security surveillance camera footage. We obtained the communications between emergency services and 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 the dispatcher and police and fire, and that's how we stitch together all the information. And I think it's also very important to be clear about what you don't know at the time you're publishing. So the great thing is about these kind of investigations that you don't need to believe us for our word because so much in the, of the information is public that any reader or viewer can say like, oh, I'm going to take that bit of information and check it, right? Because it's publicly available information. People can do that. And I think that's a very that reinstates a lot of trust in uh, mainstream media, so to say, traditional media, because it's so transparent. And um, I would say the error margin is, 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 is what we're always focused on. Like, hey, we only want to figure out, we're only going to publish it if we're very confident in the conclusions that we have derived from, um, from, from the information we're publishing. How receptive are courts to this type of evidence because presumably you know it's relatively new so how how are courts treating it you know in terms of being acceptable evidence very good that's a, that's a very good question um that you're that, that is being asked um Thank, thank you for that. Um, basically, I would say um, we have seen in 2017 the first, let's say, um, uh, uh, arrest warrant uh, issued by the International Criminal Court, the ICC in The Hague, that was solely based on social media evidence. So we have here a Libyan commander that either executed or ordered executions of uh, prisoners of war on video, it was taped, it was published on Facebook and YouTube. And um, and um, um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I was just in the, in the questions. And um, we have to see how that evidence stands in court, right? But already what you can see with the um, with the arrest warrant is that it kind of relieves eyewitnesses that 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 if it if it's solely based the evidence on eyewitness accounts right um there's a lot of pressure on the eyewitnesses but if you can corroborate that information with visual evidence which in this case is the case um we may see that um that it may hold up in court now we have seen national courts in germany and spain and i think norway or sweden where visual evidence has already been used um but i think in the years to come we're going to see um, to what extent is going to be used. Think of conflicts like uh, the current conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, there is an end to the war right now, a very sudden end. And we can see more footage coming out of sometimes Armenian soldiers um, hor hor horribly um, uh, 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 torturing uh, uh, captives uh, of war, uh, mostly Azerbaijani soldiers, but mostly from the Azerbaijani side, we have been seeing Azerbaijani soldiers that we can recognize from their very specific equipment, um, mostly special forces actually, which makes it even uh, more horrific because the, these should be highly trained um, uh, guys. Um, beheading, um, uh, slicing off ears of suspected civ Armenian civilians. They're filming this themselves, and we're seeing this in Syria, we're seeing this in Myanmar, we're seeing this in 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 in, in other countries, right? The question is, this is their they they they're publishing the evidence themselves, right? That's that's kind of wild. But does it either mean that we can use this in international courts to hold them to account? Or are we at this stage of the world that you can just do and conduct these kind of crimes? You can even film and publish it yourself on your social media page 
and nothing is going to happen. So I am not a legal expert, but I do know that a lot of um, folks are looking into this. And I think there is hope. Um, the, the University of California, Berkeley, uh, their Human Rights Center has just launched the protocol of using open source evidence in, in, in courts. So I, I do think we're going to hear a lot about this in, in the coming months uh, and years. Um, what, one question that's relevant to our audience is that uh, fraudsters have, have this nasty habit of disappearing once they've got the money. Um, presumably, this uh, technology could prove useful in tracking them down. Yes. I mean, the very, very often we're looking like at um, specifically rich individuals that um, uh, disappear. And sometimes the money um, um, helps them do this as well. So remember I showed the, the ship and the plane trackers? There are some wealthy figures that we're trying to track and we have the numbers of their private jets. Think of guys like uh, Eric Prince in the US uh, private military industry or um, uh, Russian figures in the private military industry. And we have some airplanes that are linked to them and they are not trackable sometimes on these websites because they are being asked to, to do, or they, for some reason they're paying to um, not show this information. However, um, because with the small breadcrumbs that we sometimes have, a name, a phone number, um, an indication where somebody may live, we can use uh, satellite imagery or radar data or any kind of other social media footage sometimes to track them down or at least get a hunch of where they may be and then combine it with traditional ways of reporting, like going to a site, asking people, finding sources. So um, think of, 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 of businessmen, whether, they're, whether they're, the, they're from the US or whether they're from China, from Russia or Azerbaijan, right? Doesn't really matter, but yeah, um, we always look at the kind of information that's available um, build timelines of it, uh, build uh, a geographical uh, a sense, awareness of where people may be. Um, so, um, yeah, for anyone listening uh, or, or David yourself, if there's ever something you think we should look into, please do let me know, right? Because we are like, I mean, it's our passion to do it, but there's also like, we have a great platform, the New York Times, to like, get resources to kind of like go on these um, uh, uh, investigative tours, I would say, yeah. Are, are you available, for, uh, you know, to do sort of private work outside of the New York Times? Now, I, I am a staff reporter right now at the New York Times, so I only work for the New York Times. Um, uh, so I don't do anything outside of the New York Times. Uh, the group I am coming from, Bellingcat, um, is one of the pioneers of this uh, kind of investigations. Um, uh, they do, uh, if they think investigations are in the public interest, they may be interested. But what is important to understand is that this is a network that is sometimes uh, also very much reliant on volunteers. And uh, many of the volunteers, right, they got jobs with, with I, I work at the New York Times, another guy I used to work with now works at the BBC. Others work at private firms or are limp, simply freelancers. So yes, there is there is definitely a crowd that, that is doing these kind of things um, uh, uh, privately. And I think um, uh, that community is always, they, they, they you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide variety of folks and um, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, they will be doing freelance work for, let's say, a satellite company or like another kind of like private, uh, uh, private investigative company. Um, yeah. Okay, so we're running out of time. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll introduce you at the end. You know, ours is a very uh, non-traditional conference. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Christian. <laughs> thank you so much, David, and thank you so much for having me. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I mean, I think I can learn a lot from uh, the work uh, uh, Offshore Alert is doing. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing to our investigative news and documents service and attending our events. For more information, visit offshorealert.com.